have mercy. This morning, say amen. Let's give God some praise for the choir. Amen. Every head bowed. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your presence here this morning. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for the choir remembering the great Andre Crouch. Thank you for the legacy that he has left through song. We thank you this morning for Martin Luther King and how he has empowered our people to be at a better place. We thank you now, Heavenly Father, for us flashing back to how we used to be and what we used to do and how you look beyond our faults and saw our needs. God, we thank you. Now we pray that you stay with us just a few moments longer. Hide me behind your cross. Let there be none of me in all of thee that you might get glory. When somebody comes running, I yield, I yield. What must I do to be saved? We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said amen and amen. Go ahead and give him one more praise. How many of you are already blessed? Oh, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I want to use two isolated verses. One from John, the 10th chapter, just verse 10. And then John, the 15th chapter, just verse 11. And the NIV reads accordingly. John 10 and 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And then in John 15, 11, he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And I want to marry these two verses, if you would allow me to this morning, entitled today's sermon, 
getting past your past. Getting past your past. In the Christmas Carol, and I know you've heard it and you've seen it, Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by the ghost of Christmas past, who against his will takes him back to a time when he was still a young man. Scrooge sees himself proposing to a woman he loved, a woman who later breaks their engagement because she realizes that he has come to love money more than her. As Scrooge watches the scene unfold, we can see the emotions playing out over his face. We can imagine what is going through his mind, what a fool he had been, how his life would have been different if he had married, if his heart hadn't been hardened by the love of money. Uh, perhaps that young man wouldn't have become this wretched, bitter, old miser. Well, consider this. How would you like to be visited by a ghost of your past? Uh, how would you like to go back and relive your sins, your mistakes, the foolish choices that changed your life? Ooh. How would you like to be forced to watch helplessly, knowing what the outcome is going to be, unable to do anything to change the result, feeling the sharp pain of regret at not having taken the other path, or at least wondering what would have happened had your choices been different? Well, for most of us, there's really no need for the nighttime visit from one of Charles Dickens' three spirits. Uh, why, Pastor? Because we do it to ourselves. Uh, we replay the past over and over and over again. We see it projected on the screen of our minds. Don't, don't you sometimes wish you could go back and talk to yourself at those key moments, talk to that person in the movie of your life, warn them, <coughs> tell them where the road, the road that they're going to take, where it will lead, where the decision for that moment would take them. Uh, now that you know what you know, don't you sometimes wish that you could go back and change things so that you could be in a better place today? Uh, we've all experienced regret over time uh, and over the past. It takes on many forms. Uh, regrets over marriage. Uh, imagining how much happier your life would have been if you had married someone other than the person you're sitting next to. Somebody say amen. Or... If you've never married that person you're divorced from, regrets over divorce, regrets over broken relationships of all kind, regrets over mess-ups and breakdowns, regrets over mistakes you made raising your kids, regrets over career moves that were bad moves, missed business opportunities, poor vocational choices, regrets at not following God's call to the ministry or his call to the missionary. In general, regrets over all kinds of sins and consequences. You fill in the blank. Uh, you drank too much. You spent too much time. You, when you went out, you hung out with the wrong crowd and went too much. Uh, regrets haunt every last one of us because every last one of us at one time or another has made an unwise decision. Do I have any honest people in the house? Now, now sorrow over sin can be healthy up to a point. Uh, it, it can help us from our mistakes so that we don't repeat the same old mistake again and again and again. This is the sadder but wiser phenomenon. It can lead to repentance and forgiveness. But regret is anything but helpful. It's destructive and debilitating. It allows the sins and the mistakes of the past to reach out and poison our present. I hope I got to pray in church. And if it's not handled appropriately, it will just lead to more wrong choices and more regret in a vicious cycle. Do I have a witness? That's why the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Now let me see if I can help somebody. 
Sometimes people respond to regret by trying to undo the consequences of their past choices in ways that are illegitimate. A man decides he's married the wrong woman. So he divorces his wife and marries someone else, leaving a shattered family behind. Often he'll find that the second wife wasn't the right one either, and he will continue repeating the cycle. Do I have a praying church? Uh, let me see if I can help you some more. Or, or a couple who has had sexual relationships outside of the marriage, and the woman becomes pregnant. They try to undo what they've done through an abortion, even though in their hearts they know that what they have created is a baby and not just a mass of cells. But they try to cover up their mess up, and so the abortion creates more guilt and more regret. The problem is that we can't undo the past and we usually just make things work worse when they try. Somebody say amen. amen. You may recall the Israelites, they tried this in the Old Testament with disastrous results. Let me refresh your memory and summarize the story. Numbers chapter 13 records that God freed them from slavery in Egypt and brought them to the border of Canaan, a land that God had already promised to give them, a good land described as one that was flowing with milk and honey. But before crossing the border, the people sent in 12 spies to explore the territory and bring back a report. Unfortunately, the report wasn't good. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, urged them to go in, but the other 10 spies urged them to retreat. They went back to the group and said, the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified. There are people, they are stronger than we are. What did the people do? Did they trust God's promises? Did they obey him and enter the promised land? You know the story. No. They panicked. They rebelled against God and refused to go in. As a result, God pronounced judgment on them. For 40 years, they would be vagabonds and wanderers in the desert. None of them would enter the promised land. Only their children would. So what do the people do? Of course, they regret their disobedience. And here's the key point. But they tried to undo what they had done and do it illegitimately. Numbers 14, chapter 14 records. So first they disobeyed God by refusing to enter when he said enter. Then they regretted their first disobedience but disobeyed again by trying to go in when God told them to stay out. I wish I had a praying church in here. I've learned that when God says to go, you ought to go. When God says to stay, you ought to stay. When I am obedient, I will reap the blessing that he has in store for me. Do what God tells you to do. If he tells you to serve, serve. If he tells you to give, give. If he tells you to go, then go. If he tells you to sit still, then sit still. Regret becomes destructive when you try to undo our bad choices illegitimately. The result is only more bad choices, more pain, more regrets. I don't know about you, but I'm going to leave my past in the past. Anybody going to be with me? So what if I spent too much money on the wrong things? For sure, I can't get it back. So I'm going to leave the past in the past. So what if I said the wrong thing at the wrong time? Words are like stones. Once they let them go, you can't get them back. So leave the past in the past. So what if I did not take care of my body when I was younger, smoked too much, ate too much, stayed out too late, stayed out at night, hanging around with the wrong people, except the fact that you're going to reap what you sow. You've got to get going and don't look back. Leave the past in the past. Regret is also unhealthy when it leads to an attitude of hopelessness. When the enemy gets all in your mind, you'll start having an attitude of hopelessness. You start asking yourself, what difference does it make? I've already messed up. I've already destroyed God's plan for my life. 
No matter how hard I work, I can never have anything more than second best. So why even try? The result of this attitude can be just giving ourselves over to do nothing, including sinning and making no attempt to obey God. Why follow God or why keep his commandments when the good life he had planned for us is out of reach, lost forever because of my sins? That's why I'd like to suggest to you that you ought to get your past and put your past in the past. Regret can also lead to apathy, paralysis, and paralysis, and an unwillingness to seek God's blessing. In every phase of your life, in your marriage, in your family, on your job, in your ministry, why try to love your husband or wife? Why try to seek God's best for your marriage when you know you've already messed that up by marrying what you think is the wrong person or by getting what you think is a divorce? Why try to honor God with your career when you're in the wrong career anyway, when you know you should have obeyed God's call to get into ministry? Your apathy will have you asking yourself, how can God bless me when I can never get back on the path of his will for my life? Is that how somebody feels? Do you worry that your sin has hopelessly ruined the story of your life? That the story of your life can never come the way God intended it? Well, I've got some good news for you. All you have to do is get your past and leave it in your past. The good news is that, that we don't have to be paralyzed by regrets. We don't have to let it rob us from the joy and the hope that God has promised us as our birthright in Jesus Christ. Jesus says in the text 10 and 10, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Then he follows up and says, I have told you this so that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. Those promises of abundant life and joy for all are for all. All the followers, all of us, say to your neighbor, that's for me. And all those who have accepted Christ Jesus, and not just for those who have never made a serious error in judgment or who have never committed a major sin. These promises are for every one of Christ's disciples, whatever their background, whatever sins or mistakes their past may contain. I just want to help you in 2015 to get past your past so that you can have an abundant life and a joy that is full. What is abundance? It's more than enough. What is joy? It's more than happiness. Anybody in here want joy unspeakable and full of glory? Anybody in here want peace like a river? Anybody in here want strength when you're weak? Joy in your sorrow? Hope for tomorrow? Water when you're thirsty? Anybody in here want God's joy? Say yes! I, I, I want to join, I can get his joy, but I got to leave my past in the past. So how do I get my past in the past? I, I'm glad you asked. Uh, here's the prescription from God's word. Point number one, first correct your theology. Many people think that God has one perfect plan for their lives. As long as they stay in that plan by walking in obedience and seeking his guidance for major decisions, they will enjoy God's best. But if at any point they mess up badly enough by sinning or by not seeking his guidance or by making a foolish decision, then they are out of God's plan and they can never again enjoy his full blessing on their lives. They are basically on their own. Anybody ever been there? Or as a variation of that idea, you may have heard that God has an ideal plan A for your life. But if we fail, God isn't completely thwart. He is wise and powerful enough to come up with a new replacement plan, plan B. 
Plan B isn't as good as the ideal plan, plan A, but it's better than nothing. And if we blow that plan, then God devises another plan, plan C, which is inferior to plan A and B, but at least it's an improvement over just abandoning us in our own messes. And the theology goes on and on. Here's my theological summary of what the Bible says about that idea. Hogwash, baloney. That's not the way it works. God knows us. He knows everything there is to know about us. He knows your past. He knows your present. And he even knows what you're going to do in the future. It isn't surprising to him when you do what you do. He knows that we're going to mess up. And he knows when we're going to mess up and how we're going to mess up. He knows we're going to sin. God would hardly be all-knowing if his plan for our life required perfect obedience and wisdom on our part. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He knows that he created us out of a dollar ninety-eight cents worth of dirt and breathe into us the breath of life. He knows that our lives are jacked up. It's all messed up. So he's going to look beyond our faults and see our needs. But we've got to recognize without him, we are nothing. But with him, we are everything. we got to recognize that greater is he that is within me than he that is within the world. When we recognize, then your theology gets right. Somebody says, here's the bottom line. You can't ruin God's plan. We can't dwarf the will of God. God is sovereign over things, and he brings about exactly the results that he intends in the world and in our lives. Whatever you're going through and whatever you went through, it is by God's design. Daniel 4.35 reminds us that he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Let me see if I can help you some more. Isaiah, Isaiah 46 and 9 says, remind us. He's talking. I am God. There is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come? I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please, because I'm God all by myself. Number one, correct your theology. Number two, accept this reality. <laughs> I'm glad you asked what reality. <laughs> it means that you are exactly where God wants you. In spite of all of the junk in your trunk <laughs> and the junk in your past, you are exactly where God wants you. All of your sins and mistakes that you thought were detours, exit ramps from God's plan for your life, were in reality a part of his plan. You are right now, and always have been, precisely in the center of God's plan. There was never a possibility that would be otherwise. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that you can derail God's plan for somebody else's life? Can I ruin God's plan for Alfreda Massey? <laughs> Is God so weak and powerless that he can't do what he wants in someone else's life because of your sin? No, of course it's no. Then why do you think that you can dwarf God's purposes for your own life? Is he any less sovereign when he comes to you or when he comes to me? Let me see if I can help somebody. 
Consider this. What was the greatest sin in history? The worst thing that any person or group of people ever did. How about murdering the Son of God? How about putting to death the most righteous and holy man who ever walked the face of the earth? And yet, as supremely evil and as wicked as the act was, the Bible tells us that it did not dwarf God's plan. In fact, it was part of God's plan. Oh, somebody missed that. What you're going through, that hard time, the heartache and the headache, the physical pain, the financial bind, whatever it is, whatever the struggle, it is in God's plan. Isaiah 53 and 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. Acts 2 and 23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Acts 4, 27, indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. If the greatest sin in history was part of God's sovereign plan, then your sins and my sins are included in that plan. Your sin has not dwarfed God's plan for your life. Does that mean that you're any less accountable for your sins? Oh, no. You are accountable for them. We are still guilty. We are still in need to receive God's forgiveness from our sin through Christ Jesus. But what it does mean is that ever now and then, the greatest sins are not powerful enough to derail God's purpose for my life. I don't care what you're going through. God's got a plan. He's going to take you from here to get you over here regardless of what you do. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Hey! Come on, Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you. Declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and plans to give you a future. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Number one, to get past your past, correct your theology. Number two, accept this reality. And finally, the text says, move forward with expectancy. Ah, God's, God's purpose are eternal from before time. His purposes for the world are eternal. And his purposes for you and for me are eternal. Somebody say amen. They don't change. They are not altered or voided because of our sins or our bad choices. Somebody say amen. Let me see if I can help somebody. Y'all slow on the amens. Matthew 26. It's recorded that the apostle Peter was one of the 12 disciples and one of Jesus' three closest friends. On the day that Jesus was arrested, Peter not only fled, but he abandoned Christ, his friend and his Lord. He denied that he even knew the man. But Peter's betrayal of Christ, his sin and failure, didn't ruin God's plan for him. After Christ rose from the dead, not only did he forgive Peter, but he recommissioned him as an apostle. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter's feelings got hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus simply replied, 
then feed my sheep. Peter went on to become one of the founders and leaders of the early church and the author of two of the books in the New Testament. And Peter is hardly unique. Moses, the man God called to lead Israel out of Egypt, had murdered a man and had to flee his homeland. David, you remember David, don't you? Israel's greatest king had an adulterous liaison with the wife of one of the soldiers, and then he had the soldier killed, and yet God restored him to the throne. Saul of Tarsus, who became the apostle Paul, had been a persecutor of Christians, throwing them in jail and having them executed. There's hardly a main character in the Bible who isn't guilty of some gross sin. But God, but God, but God still used them to accomplish his purpose. So what's the point, preacher? It's all about getting past your past and moving forward with expectancy. All of these men suffered consequences for their sins, but even the worst sins did not alter God's plan for his people. God uses sinners to accomplish his purpose. If for no other reason, we're all that he's got to work with. Because he wants to use me I can expect him to bless me. Consider Charles Coulson, the aide to Richard Nixon, who was sent to jail for Watergate. As a result of his experience as a convicted felon, Coulson founded Prison Fellowship, now the world's largest Christian outreach to prisoners and their families. The Prison Fellowship Ministry has more than 50,000 volunteers working in hundreds of prisons in 88 countries around the world. A ministry that has blessed millions of people got started 45 years ago because Charles Colson committed a crime. God's internal purpose for that man included even the sin that sent him to prison. It was a part of God's plan from the very beginning. If you have given your life to Christ and you are obedient to his will, following his word, doing things his way, you can move forward in 2015 with expectancy. Your past is your past. And know that God will use it to get you where you need to be in the future. Do I have anybody who's moving forward with expectancy? Touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor, excuse me. Move aside. But I'm expecting God to bless me. I'm expecting him to send my way. I'm expecting him to bless me. I'm expecting him to heal me. I'm expecting my breakthrough. I'm expecting my financial blessing. I'm expecting that the joy in him will be the joy in me. And my joy will be full. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes.